Hello, hello one, hello all. Good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're sitting. It is so nice to welcome you back, I can say, to the 2021 Baltic Sea Youth Dialogue, and also to welcome some of you for the first time, that is our speakers, of course, and those of you who could join, unfortunately, yesterday. So uh, you should, of course, then watch the recording we are happy to have you today and meet you. Yesterday I had two slides on the background of CBSS and BSYD, but uh, today we can basically jump in directly. Let me just quickly give you or remind us where today and these lectures fit into the overall BSYD. Namely, we're here for the three dialogue lectures where we discuss with our great speakers about looking forward, looking back 30 years of collaboration in the Baltic Sea region and that with different focuses uh, each of the three days. Based on that is the cross-country assignment. For this, we will have the first so-called mentor session tomorrow after the lecture. The lecture tomorrow is at 9.30 and after that, we have the mentor session and you should really be there. This is when you first meet your groups. You might get to know whom you're working with and who you can become friends with and network with. And yeah, maybe don't look right and left right here, but across the screen and when we're talking in the discussion and the Q&A and you might see the faces who, who are in your group then. Um, but yeah, you will then create some work together based on what you hear and discuss now. So listen, enjoy, ask many questions. Today we are uh, off to another important and very interesting topic, sustainable and prosperous region or environmental collaboration. Um, so please welcome our speakers. We have Dominic Litvas with us. Communication Secretary at Helcom and Olga Zoin, Program Coordinator here at the CBSS. So I'm um, putting our hands together and the screen is yours. Good, good afternoon or good evening. <laughs> um, Dominic, do you want to say hello too? Yeah, good evening, everybody. And it's really great to be here <laughs> despite being already quite late and I've been told that some of you would prefer to be somewhere else but on the other hand it's great to see that you know that you're all committed to this kind of event and this is really heartwarming to be honest and I'm glad to be associated to this thanks yes and thank you from my side too uh, I don't see you uh, yet um, but before we start, uh, I would like to know a little bit of you. So um, I will tell you a little bit of me. And uh, uh, whilst I speak, I uh, would be very much appreciating if you could write um, what, what you're doing, if you're studying, if you're working, if you're taking a sabbatical year, just uh, for me to, to know um, very generally what you do and who you are. And I would like also to say that if um, I sometimes speak too fast or if I use words that are too difficult, uh, please either you feel free to raise your hand and jump in, or if it is um, if you are not comfortable with that, write in the chat even just personally to me. So I sometimes utilize maybe difficult language because for me and my mother language, Latin based words are simpler, uh, but it can be difficult for, for someone not Latin based language. So please, um, this is just very, we are learning together. I will learn a lot from Dominique myself too. So um, let us make this as uh, inclusive as we can. So um, what if once you write uh, who you are, um, I am Olga Zuin. 
and I work at the Council of the Baltic Sea States Secretariat since 2016. Uh, but my uh, professional life starts actually a bit further away from the Baltic Sea. I was born in a town called Padova that is located in northern eastern Italy. It's uh, 40 kilometers from Venice. And that's where I started uh, studying. I studied um, anthropology in the University of Venice. And of course, as you know, climate change is something that we live every day there. Um, so during my studies, I got the wonderful opportunity to study with an Erasmus program for 10 months in the University of Uppsala in Sweden. And I thought, uh, yeah, let's try a very different um, season uh, and weather. Um, region of Europe. So um, it was very enriching for me to uh, meet other people and also get a bit out of my comfort zone, speak every day in a language that was not mine, uh, and try to learn maybe a new language that I didn't didn't speak at all, as, is, as was Swedish. Um, I'm lucky enough that everybody can speak English, so no problem. But uh, from there, I got to know a lot of people and I got in contact with the Baltic University program, which is a program of um, universities around the Baltic Sea that collaborate on many topics related to environment and sustainability. So I started getting my way in the Baltic Sea region as a project assistant. And from there, I worked developing a report that was actually commissioned by the Council of the Baltic Sea States about sustainability. Uh, because it was a time where there was this whole discussions about sustainable development and where we would be going. So I was very lucky to find myself perhaps in the right place at the right time. But of course, one also looks for the opportunities. And that's how slowly I made my way. I, when there was an opening position at the CBSS, I applied. And then I started working as the project assistant at the CBSS. Uh, also thanks to my background and uh, then uh, with time I learned new things and now I'm program coordinator uh, within the sustainable and prosperous region so that's just one story of uh, how I've gotten here and maybe you will see that uh, of an inspiration for you too or if you have other questions uh, please feel free but uh, maybe also Dominique want to tell a little bit how he has gotten to Helcom. Yeah, um, I came to Helcom via a couple of detours. So as Francisca already, when she introduced me, she already mentioned that I'm Helcom's communication secretary and I'm, I've been that since uh, 2018. Uh, but before the Helcom Secretariat, I was in Brazil, way in Rio de Janeiro, where I worked for an um, for United Nations uh, Human Settlement Program, so the UN, the, the urban guys, the UN Habitat. And before that, I worked also for the same organization in their headquarters in Nairobi, um, East Africa. <laughs> and before that, I worked for the German embassy in uh, Nairobi. And I had moved there because I was previously working for um, for a publishing company that had an office in Nairobi, but I had first started at their headquarters in Uganda, also East Africa, and I initially came to Uganda via the French, uh, the French Foreign Service, where I was working for um, two years. And this is how I came to the Baltic Sea, as I said, via a couple of detours. But my main focus uh, has always been communications. And especially in uh, in multilateral or bilateral environments, and that has always been like you know the, the common threads through through my entire career. And I have a background in um, international um, communications um, or you know, communication strategy, and I studied in uh, I mainly studied in France actually. So I'm half French and uh, half German. Thank you. That is wonderful, and. Uh... I, I have no words. The variety of uh, people that we have in the room is amazing, really different backgrounds. So I'm, I'm really glad that we, we have this very international environment, even if we are in the Baltic Sea region. And I believe this is one of the richness of this, of this era of the world that 
that receives a lot of contributions from everywhere in a very inclusive environment. But so uh, now we go to, I don't know, some uh, more interesting or more boring topic. We will see. Uh, we have tested with Francisca this method where she will share the screen, but I will be in full control. So let us see if it works again. So I should be, yes. Yes. So uh, what we're gonna talk about today here is uh, uh, the sustainable and prosperous region overall work in the Baltic Sea region. And uh, we have this, uh, we have thought that the Dominic and I have really good, uh, we, we are intertwining each other. We are uh, complementing each other. So we will try to utilize a bit of a hybrid presentation format. Let's see how it works. Uh, but nothing can be said about sustainable and prosperous region without talking about the global 2030 agenda. And um, I don't know how many of you know about this or how much in depth, but I will try to be uh, very brief, but give you an overview. This is an agenda that uh, one way or another, everybody among us must know, because this was adopted by the United Nations and it was adopted by all our countries. Uh, it's an agenda that looks at the sustainability of our world uh, until 2030, and it's very, very ambitious. Uh, it uh, says that uh, we can't be sustainable if only one country is sustainable. It's not only the less uh, developed country, but it is all countries that must work on this uh, sustainability because we are all in our way uh, not that sustainable. So this, this agenda uh, very quickly is uh, summarized into 17 goals uh, that are these uh, little squares. And they touch about all the aspects of sustainability. So both economy, social and environmental sustainability. And this, these goals can be a bit overwhelming if one looks at them for the first time. Um, but what is really, really important to remember is that they help us uh, preserve, let's say, the fi five Ps. It's very easy. It's peace, it's people, it's planet, it's partnership, and it is the fifth that I never remember. <laughs> um, yes, I don't remember the fifth, but it is like the really the the overall overarching uh sustain sustainability so this is a global agenda and we will look into some of these goals a bit in detail but um what is important is that when we look at the overall uh goals of course there are some countries that have some challenges and other countries have others, but all of us cannot achieve it in our national bubble. We need to look at what our neighbors do as well and help each other becoming more sustainable. And that is also highlighted by the agenda itself that the role of the regions is really important because they have this midway between our local communities and local actions and the overall global and national uh, actions, the regions help us create these links across borders, but still have a manageable uh, type of collaboration. And that is why we in the Council of the Baltic Sea States together with uh, uh, our steering group that is called Expert Group on Sustainable Development and of which I will talk a little bit later, have um, come together and discussed how these goals apply to our region. And the result has been this document that you see here, it's called the Baltic 2030 Action Plan, which is a vision. What are the main priorities for us and how do we achieve them? So we have six overall uh, actions uh, or focus areas and six, we call them activation processes. So it's 
activities, collaborations, actions that need to happen if we want to be sustainable in these six priority areas. And of course, this document, this vision you can find online. So I will uh, not, I will not go in detail uh, on this, uh, not to give too much information. Uh, but what is important is that we are not selecting one or two or six of these goals. For us, all the goals need to be included because uh, uh, this 23rd agenda is, is systematic and holistic. It means that each goal is depending on each other. We cannot have, uh, for example, economic development by making our climate uh, more unsustainable. And we cannot have, for example, social equality if we are not resolving problems of education, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, for us, it was really important to keep this, uh, it, this uh, overall connection uh, of the goals also in the action plan. So as I mentioned earlier, this action plan was uh, developed and adopted by uh, what is called the Expert Group on Sustainable Development. And this group existed way before the 2030 Agenda was uh, launched. Uh, that I didn't mention, but it was adopted in 2015 and uh, officially launched in 2016. So it runs around 15 years. Uh, but of course, the question of uh, sustainability was there before. And that's why this expert group that you see here, this year is celebrating 25 years, because already in 1996, the ministries of uh, environment and the relevant uh, policymakers in the Baltic Sea region decided that uh, we need to collaborate to make our societies and our environment uh, more sustainable for the present and the future generations. So, uh, how do we do that? We bring together uh, experts from all the countries, both national and local level, and we decide uh, what is the thing that we need to work on together, what is the challenge that, challenges that we have together, and how can we make this better? And of course, um, the CBSS is not, uh, um, a, um, it's not a binding national government. So we, we can't say just we uh, finance a number of things and, and it will work. We, what we work is with uh, learning and cooperating. So we bring together experts and we learn from the best examples we have on a specific topic. For example, climate change, uh, which municipalities have a good idea how to deal with that? Please, uh, dear municipality from Finland, let us know how you do. And please, dear municipality from Poland, how are you doing? And we learn from each other and we come up with new ideas. That's very important. Uh, and then, of course, we have also training so that we get these back good ideas also to other people that do not have access to all these good trainings. Uh, and the third, uh, area is that we try to get new knowledge on both on a scientific but also for example with policy recommendations we develop recommendations for policymakers, for municipalities for uh, NGOs for whoever is important to outreach what can you do to improve the situation that's basically the work of the expert group on sustainable development so after we adopted the Baltic 2030 action plan, we decided that we needed to have a little bit of a scientific basis to really understand how we can, what we need to prioritize and how we can work together. And for this, you need, of course, a lot of research and statistics that is not always easy to create from one day to the other, and you need a lot of resources. So we wanted to use what is already there. So we had, uh, we commissioned a study where we asked some experts to look into all the sustainable development goals and help us identify which ones are really, really important for us to work in the Baltic Sea region. Uh, and 
we, as you see, uh, the picture is not green. Uh, and even where we are green, it doesn't mean we are really, really uh, ace in it. Uh, once we have heard uh, from a, an expert that, for example, Sweden in the top in the ranking of the world of the SDGs is number one, but it is number one of a very, very bad class. So we are all having challenges and we need to, to help each other overcoming them. So as you might not be surprised of, we're in this region, we're doing quite bad on questions of sustainable consumption and production. We import a lot and we produce huge waste. Uh, we are doing quite bad on climate action. Again, we are producing a lot of emissions and uh, don't think only what we produce in our countries. The Nordic countries tend to think like we do a lot of green things, but we purchase a lot of things from other parts of the world where they don't have much of a control system. So actually we do imported emission a lot. We are not doing great on the state of the Baltic Sea uh, and uh, also the biodiversity and all everything that is connected with uh, general um, really environmental topics. We are still, um, uh, we're still a bit uh, having troubles. So these are the areas where we focused a lot, but we also wanted to give a signal that we are not only doing all, there are not only areas where we're all doing bad, but there are also areas where some of us are doing fairly well and some others are not, or uh, goals where we have some, some specific sub areas where we're doing well, uh, and some, some areas where we're not. For example, there are, maybe we have quite a good um, unemployment rate, but if youth unemployment rate is really bad, then we're not acing the goal of economic development and decent work. So we thought of also getting into the picture these goals where we are, some of us are not doing well, but others are. And Ultimately, at the end of the day, we are still not making the goal because we're only sustainable if we all are sustainable. So when we selected these goals at the end of the day, we also thought that the goal on economic development was really important for us to work on, as well as the one on sustainable cities and communities that is the number 11 there, uh, because uh, ultimately the local level is where where we will need to act to make a real change. So out of this study, uh, we started implementing some work. And uh, one of the work that in the region we're doing is so great, but in this case, it's not the CBSS, but actually it is our good partner, Halcom, is the, the work on life below water. And, taking care of the status of the Baltic Sea. So that is why I think it is really great that we have Dominique here that can tell us a little bit more about, about the sea and, and how we're doing cooperation and what we're doing, and also how we can look forward to the future of the Baltic Sea. So now uh, we will, I think that uh, Dominique will take over from me the, Screen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Olga. And um, thank you for pointing out that we are doing great when it comes to the environmental state of the Baltic. But if you look uh, under uh, your, if you look at um, SDG 14, life below water, it is rather red and uh, dark orange. And we made some considerable progress since uh, the late, since the late 80s. But the fact is that despite you know, trends of improvements, we are still not yet there where we need to be. So currently, as we speak, as I speak, the Baltic Sea is not in a good uh, ecological and environmental state. And there are many, you know, many pres pressures still affecting uh, the Baltic. And one of the reasons also is that you know, the, the shape and uh, the shape of the Baltic itself, this, the Baltic Sea is a semi-enclosed uh, water body, like almost like a lake. It actually used to be a lake um, a few thousand years ago, 
So whatever enters the Baltic Sea is due to stay there for a rather long time. And it really takes the ecosystem um, decades to digest, you know, literally digest whatever we have been adding to, to the Baltic. And I will stop uh, doing the talking here and have show you a video that explains um, the pressures on and the state of the Baltic Sea uh, in, yeah, in a concise, concise way. That's tonight's Netflix moment, uh, if I may. And then uh, after that, I'll, um, I'll go into a little bit more details about uh, the pressures affecting the sea, especially eutrophication and what we can do about it. We who live around the Baltic Sea use it in many ways to benefit our economies and well-being. But our activities both on sea and on land have also affected the environment, causing threats to species and impacting the benefits we gain from the sea. To restore the health of the Baltic Sea environment, all nine Baltic coastal countries and the EU work together through HELCOM. HELCOM members have committed to the ambitious Baltic Sea Action Plan and to global sustainable development goals. To follow up on the progress towards reduced eutrophication and hazardous substances, thriving biodiversity and safe marine activities, countries monitor and jointly assess the status of the marine environment. For the recent State of the Baltic Sea report, HELCOM members have agreed on core indicators to measure whether the different parts of the ecosystem have reached good status. The report looks into all major human activities and assesses their pressures on the marine environment, adding up their total impact on species and habitats. Combining a wide range of information, this groundbreaking report creates a comprehensive, holistic assessment of the current state of the Baltic marine environment. The report shows that we've made some progress, leading to certain signs of improvement in the marine life. For example, inputs of nutrients in the sea are lower than in many years. Smaller amounts of certain hazardous substances are ending up in the sea, and there are less and smaller oil spills than before. But the report also shows that the improvements made so far have not yet been sufficient for the Baltic Sea to recover. Most of the Baltic Sea is still suffering from eutrophication. There are several hazardous substances which still cause problems in the environment. Many species are still threatened. For example, fish are smaller and grow more slowly than before, and there are worrying signs across the food web. So although we are making progress, the Baltic Sea is not yet in a good state. We polluted the sea heavily for decades in the past, and it's taken a long time to achieve reductions. So it's no surprise it takes even longer for the environment to recover. Some agreed actions are yet to be completed. New complex issues are constantly emerging and developing, and they challenge us to keep learning. The State of the Baltic Sea report gives a clearer picture than ever before of where we are now, how things are connected, and what still needs to be done. In order to secure a sustainable future, we must now put the new knowledge to use. Right. So I'd now like you to have a look at, at this slide here. And you know, if you look at the shape on your, on your right, you will probably see that this is Northern Europe. You will see Norway, Sweden, um, Denmark, Right, but if you look a little bit closer, uh, what the blue, the blue lines are actually, they are actually rivers. And why is this, why am I showing this to you? It's because wherever you are in this, in this area, chances are that, you know, the water, that whatever, you know, activities that you have in that area, that water, then with the water then flows back into the Baltic Sea. It's like the, the catchment area 
uh, carries you know, pollutants, hazardous substances, uh, it all goes back, it all flows back into the Baltic Sea. So even if you are far away from the sea, chances are that your activities will have an impact uh, on, on the, the Baltic. And whether you are in Warsaw, whether you are in, uh, in Tampere or, in, uh, uh, or in, in, uh, in Vilnius, even if you do not see the sea, you are in one way or another connected to it through, you know, through the river systems, through the aquatic system, right? And then if you look at that slide here to your right, if you see the, the dotted, the blue dotted surface, that is the catchment area of, uh, of the Baltic Sea. And it's rather large. It is four times the size of the Baltic Sea itself. And that means that, you know, whatever, you know, whatever activities that do take place in this, in this catchment area may have an impact uh, on the Baltic. And, you know, activities are plentiful. This is a very busy, you know, area in the world. It holds about 85 uh, million inhabitants, 85 million people, um, major cities, um, lots of agricultural activities, um, big industries are in that region. So the impacts are uh, actually quite important um, and the impact stemming from land, right? So there are multitudes of pressures uh, affecting the Baltic. On top of that, uh, the Baltic Sea is a rather busy uh, waterway. It's one of the you know, most shipped um, areas in the world. And you know, we estimate that you know, at any given time, there are between 1,500 and 2,000 larger vessels. So that's excluding the small, the small boats, the small ships. So it is noisy. There's lots of underwater noise. Um, accidents can happen less frequently than before, but they still can happen. And there are, of course, emissions uh, from, you know, from, from ships. So the pressures, you know, the Baltic is actually, you know, it is affected by multitudes of pressures from land and, uh, and, uh, and at sea, right? And we've seen already in the video that, you know, we've heard about hazardous substances, eutrophication uh, and so forth. But just for you to gain a little bit of, a, of an idea, what are the top pressures on the Baltic? And, you know, by far really, you know, the first, the largest single pressure on the Baltic Sea environment uh, are nutrient concentrations. And nutrient concentration is what is leading to uh, eutrophication. And I'll get back to that uh, a little bit later. But as you can see on the graph to your right, I mean, when we're looking at, you know, the problems, this really is by far uh, the biggest problem on the Baltic. And then, you know, followed by you know, hazardous substances uh, and marine litter, as well as the introduction of uh, non-indigenous species, um, what we also call um, alien species. And they mainly enter the Baltic seas through ballast water. So from ships from that you know, take up ballast water in other seas and other parts of the world. And then when they discharge that ballast water, then these species, these alien species then you know, take over habitats. And um, that is, for instance, the case of the round goby as a fish that is originating from, uh, you know, from the Black Sea and that yeah, got introduced to the Baltic via, via ships and is now spreading here and you know, taking over um, and disrupting um, you know, the, the native habitats. And then of course, uh, over what we call uh, extraction of fish, which is just, you know, a fancy, fancy word for saying uh, overfishing. <laughs> Uh, but these are really, you can see, these are by far um, the, the, biggest, the biggest pressures, right? So what is eutrophication? And then if you are dealing with the Baltic and if you're dealing with the Baltic Sea environment, this is something that will pop up, you know, and every second word is eutrophication. Uh, in every conversation you will hear uh, eutro eutrophication, uh, what is it? And it's basically eutrophication is um, you know, an excessive concentration of nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen in the water body that leads to excessive uh, primary production and primary production that is um, basically, you know, gross. Uh, and in our case, uh, algal grows. So this amounts in you know, this excessive amounts of uh, nutrients from either agricultural sources uh, or, you know, also from municipal sources, um, they then, you know, they lead to an excessive growth of algae. And when these algae, uh, when they die, and when they decompose, they, in the process, it takes up uh, oxygen. And the Baltic Sea is already, already by, by nature, uh, in, its, you know, in its normal state, the oxygen concentrations are rather low. That's because the sea is not, you know, it's quite brackish, it's not very salty. So there is not much uh, oxygen in the, in the water itself uh, already. 
but these algae is then deplete uh, the oxygen resources even more. And when there is no oxygen uh, dissolved in the water, that then in turn means that, you know, that, that drives away um, biodiversity and either, you know, plants die or, you know, species uh, like, like fish um, just, you know, move away and go to oxygen richer uh, areas. And then when fish move away, and of course, you know, marine mammals also move away and then, you know, the, the entire, you know, entire biodiversity is, is disrupted. And we, exp we estimate that about a quarter of the Baltic Sea is already dead. It's a dead zone. So a quarter is uh, completely depleted um, from oxygen. And about a third is, has very low, you know, very low oxygen uh, uh, concentrations. And this has, of course, also effects on not just on, on the ecosystem, but also on, uh, on the economy. And this is a bit, this is a very good example because it shows that you know, the, there's a correlation between the health of the ecosystem and our own well being. Right? So, oceans and seas are life support systems, but they are also you know, the source of, of our own well being. And in the case of the Baltic, um, eutrophication, we estimate that, you know, it leads to about 4.4 billion euros uh, in losses annually. And these 4.4 billion, it's um, a lot of comes, of course, from tourism. Tourism is like the main, the biggest loser because nobody wants to go to a beach that where you cannot swim. The problem with the algae is that they, you know, in some cases also have, you know, toxic effects and you can get sick. Dogs, for instance, can even die and us humans, yeah, we'll have some have some severe headaches um, there and whatnot. So it's not a pleasant, <laughs> not a pleasant experience. So 4.4 billion, um, these are what we estimate to be, you know, the losses due to um, the Baltic Sea being in a eutrophied, eutrophied state. And we've seen in the video, uh, but also here on the map to your right, 97% um, of the Baltic Sea is affected in one way or another. Some areas are a bit more heavily affected, as you can see, like in the you know the south uh, towards Poland and Germany, um, the Arkona Basin is heavily affected. But you know all other areas are also you know, affected by by eutrophication, and you know we can have algal blooms uh, these days almost anywhere in the Baltic, and uh, also at any you know at, at any given time. It's we've also seen algal blooms already in in winter, which is rather you know rather worrying. You know, it's a very worrying sign, right? So this then also leads a little bit to, to what I, yeah, I'd like to talk to you about now. It's what we, we try to embrace uh, and try to promote the ecosystem approach and ecosystem-based management, meaning that you know, whatever activities that we, we are pursuing in the Baltic Sea region, we should also have in mind that whatever we're doing, what are the effects on, on the environment? Yeah. Whenever we do something, what does it mean for the environment? Because in turn, as I said earlier, the, the environment also you know, has an effect on our own activities and you know, on our own well-being, as we've seen with, with eutrophication, for instance. And you know, we benefit a lot. You know, we benefit a lot from the Baltic Sea. It's, you know, it's a source of food. Uh, it provides uh, you know, ecosystem services, such as you know, regulating, you know, regulating the climate, um, you know, providing, you know, cleaning the air, cleaning, cleaning water, but it's of course, you know, biggest source, um, economic source is tourism. So that provides, you know, you know, job, you know, lots of jobs and, and, and revenue, um, but also, you know, facilitating uh, maritime transport and traffic of goods and so forth. So we have actually a real interest of maintaining the sea in a, in a healthy state if you want to benefit from it. And we need to balance all of this uh, with the pressures on the sea. And we've seen these already before. These are like, yeah, mainly eutrophication, uh, hazardous substances and so forth. And so this is, this is where you know, the ecosystem approach comes in. This is really a key component uh, when, it, when it comes to Helcom's work uh, in, in, in the Baltic Sea. And so this is now rather complicated, <laughs> rather complicated sentence, but I'd like you to read, yeah, to read through it uh, with me. So ecosystem approach, what is it? Uh, it's the comprehensive integrated management of human activities based on the best available scientific knowledge about the ecosystem and its dynamics in order to identify and take action on influences 
uh, or that was too fast. Um, anyway, <laughs> you can, and it was too complicated anyway, right? So this is just summarizing it in a little bit more, uh, like in an easier way. Um, yes, it's okay for us to benefit from the sea, but then that also comes with uh, the responsibility to maintain it in a, in a healthy state. Yeah. And what is Helcom doing about it? We have recently launched, um, or we have recently updated our um, Baltic Sea Action Plan. And that plan contains 100, and to be exact, 199, so about 200 measures uh, for um, sea, for Baltic Sea in a healthy state. And if you look at that pyramid, this is a, this is you know the logic behind is that you know we need to address um, hazardous substances, which is to your left, and the orange one, uh, maritime or sea-based activities and eutrophication. In order, you know, this is what we need to sort out if you want to have uh, an ecosystem in a healthy uh, in a healthy state and an ecosystem that is resilient, right? And only if we do have the ecosystem in a healthy uh, and resilient state then we can achieve our vision of the uh, Baltic Sea um, with diverse biological components functioning in balance, uh, resulting in good ecological status and supporting a wide, wide range of uh, sustainable, sustainable economic and social activities. But the whole plan, um, if, if you look at it, uh, it is addressing the pressure stemming from, you know, from, our human, from our human activities. And because we, I mean, we are the root cause of the state, of the poor state of uh, the Baltic Sea. And there are, of course, various reasons, and we've seen some in the, in, in the video. I've, I've explained that also that due to the, you know, the particular shape of the Baltic um, being a semi-enclosed sea and water only exchanges every 30 years. So basically water is flushed out. It takes about 33 decades for water to, you know, to be renewed in the Baltic. So, which means that, Literally, I mean, whatever enters the Baltic Sea is is bound to stay there for for a very very long time. Uh, another issue that we also have is that, for instance, at Helcom we deal mainly with you know bodies tasked with um, with with the environment. That's the ministries of the environment uh, of the Baltic Sea countries or you know the, the affiliated agencies. But if you look at if you take the example of eutrophication, um, eutrophication, there are many other stakeholders involved, and for instance, agriculture. So the root cause currently, you know, the biggest uh, input stems from agricultural sources, and that means that we also need to reach out to, to agriculture, but also to we need to reach out to local governments uh, and especially those who are dealing with uh, wastewater treatment. That is also a you know, big source of nutrient inputs. So that means that you know, if you want to sort out the problems uh, of the Baltic Sea, if you want to reach good environmental status in the Baltic Sea, then we need to talk, we need you know, to reach out to, to the other sectors, um, for instance, agriculture, fisheries, uh, industries, and so forth. But currently, you know, if, if, and, and Olga will probably um, uh, confirm or you know, comment on that, we have a tendency to work in silos. Uh, and, and this is, we, are all experts in our own field, but then we and we devise clever strategies, but then we do not talk to each other. Yeah. So um, we devise action plans, but when it comes to the implementation, then there are conflicting interests uh, with you know with the other silos, uh, if I may, if I may say so. And and this is this is what is leading to very or this is what is slowing down the implementation of the actions of the actions that are actually needed for um, you know for reaching our environmental objectives. And one, and this is why I'm really glad to be able to talk here to all of you, is that because, I mean, you are probably you know future decision makers, future leaders uh, of yeah of, of tomorrow, and the more we know about you know how our oceans and seas, you know how how it works, how it connects to you know to the rest of the ecosystem, to the you know to the land to the land base, to our pressures, to the activities, to our you know human activities. Uh, the better it is, and I think it's a, you know this is something that that I would you know give you on the way is that wherever you are in in the future is you know think think about you know think about the oceans because wherever you've seen on the map uh, with the with the rivers uh, wherever you are you are even if it's not the Baltic Sea uh, it's going to be the North Sea it's going to be uh, the Mediterranean I mean wherever you are you are connected 
you know, you're connected to one larger water body. And these water bodies, you know, they are life support systems, but through our activities, we are, you know, we are basically, we're, we're destroying them or we're causing some, some serious harm. So, um, yeah. On that note, I would like to hand over to, um, to Olga. Thank you very much. And I think that this, this final statement on breaking silos is really key uh, for everyone who is working one way or another on, on problems that are so complex. And that is why I was introducing the, the concept of the sustainable development goals, because they, those are actually trying to help us look outside these silos and try to see what are the interconnection between us. So, um, ah, yes, I got control again. Let's see. Let us see if I manage. Um, hmm. Okay, this is the beautiful logo of Healthcom. We should give it uh, two seconds at least to get it in your mind so that you can go and look up. They have a huge quantity of very useful and interesting information. And for example, I find very useful the recently published climate change fact sheet that really shows what it, what it, how, how many different impacts climate change has on our region. And that is really valuable because very often we get this global effects of the climate change and we don't understand how is that going to impact me, but Helcom has done a great job on this. So thank you. Um, but actually talking really about this, this question of silos, and uh, I should add another level of complexity, which is uh, we also are, as I mentioned at the beginning, different countries and uh, each country has its own kind of, uh, like priorities, uh, its own uh, mindset sometimes, uh, its own uh, um, uh, differences in handling also the same problem. Sometimes, for example, I can, I can talk about like the, the, well, the ministry who is in charge of sustainable development. In some cases, it is the Ministry of Environment. In some cases, it's the Ministry of Economy. In some other cases, it's prime minister office. And you understand that this is really different uh, how you then work with a, a topic. And this is the same for many other, uh, many other um, sectors. So besides the challenge of having different sectors that don't work with each other, we also have the, different, the challenge that we think differently about the same topic. And that is where we at the Council of the Baltic Sea State try to make some new bridges. And here you have a slide that talks about one of the most recent initiatives that we just launched uh, uh, at the end of October. And it's a, basically the idea is a training program for experts in different uh, sectors or different areas that come together from all the countries in the Baltic Sea region to try and elaborate a common plan for actions. And we have identified these five areas that are um, ecology and environment, science, education, innovation, transport and maritime economy, culture and tourism, and labor and health and well being. And what we're going to do is to try and see really what we have in common and where we can make a concrete positive impact. And as you see, we, for us, it's really important that the SDGs are at the, co at the core, at the basis of our collaboration, because they help us think broader. For example, if I think about, um, uh, let's say, uh, transport and maritime economy, I might think as Dominic highlighted, okay, what is the impact that I can give to the Baltic Sea status, to the environment, but vice versa, what is the impact that a bad quality of the environment would have on my maritime transport and the economy? Um, 
what is the impact I am giving to the, the well-being of the population uh, on a local level, but also, for example, people that work in the sector, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So they, these goals help us really think outside the box and think um, in a different way on sectors that before we didn't. And as you see a bit in the background or transparent, there is the word youth, because one of the key goals here is that for us, it's important that young people have a say, a voice and a position in all of these areas, because we, you are experts in everything, just like experts might have some background, but you also have your own background or young people have different areas of expertise and different views and can bring you bring new perspectives that perhaps people who have studied a lot have forgotten or don't see. So um, what we're going to do here is really to try and, and have this comprehensive view on our Baltic Sea region to make it better in the future. Um, and now I'm going to just briefly show you uh, in the CBSS how we work with this sustainable and prosperous region, because so far we have told, a, at least from my side, I have told a little bit in general uh, what sustainability is for us, how, what is our reference framework, which are the SDGs, and one example of how we try to bridge between different sectors and get the countries together. But now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the specific areas we work with. And I will start with the expert group on sustainable development that I mentioned before with this 25 years. So how do we work? Um, I, I believe that you have been told that the CBSS has, has what we call a rotating presidency, which means that every year one country takes over the presidency and has the chance to guide the cooperation uh, among all the member states and uh, has its own priorities on top of the work. So right now, for example, we have uh, uh, Norway. Last year we had, uh, um, oh, what do we, do we have? Um, Lithuania, sorry, I was a bit confused. We had Lithuania and before that we had Denmark. and. Uh, all these presidencies every year come with some kind of specific topic they want to focus on. But of course, since more or less the challenges are the same, then we more or less are taking the same big road, but with some, some small nuances. Uh, and in our expert group on sustainable development, for example, we have been focusing a lot on uh, responsible consumption and production, which is this goal number 12. Uh, for example, Norway is uh, very interested in, uh, uh, and also Lithuania have been very interested in uh, green uh, transitions. For example, how do we make our industrial production greener? How do we work um, in the model of circular economy? So how do we make sure that we reduce our waste, that we reuse our waste, that we, um, for example, uh, utilize the industrial symbiosis model. What is the industrial symbiosis? It's that the waste of one industry becomes the resource of another one. Um, so that we create good links that bring both economic benefits, but also environmental uh, benefits. Um, another aspect in this consumption and production that we have focused on under, for example, Latvian presidency, was uh, the um, public, public procurement and how to get um, not only the green public procurement. So when the municipalities, for example, uh, get some uh, construction work for the public or renew, renovate schools, that they try to apply the green principles. But we want to go beyond that. We want to go to the circular principles. So what does it mean? It means how to choose the material, how to choose the different suppliers that think not only in terms of green, but the whole life cycle. So how is the material produced? How will it be used? And how will it be phased out 
uh, or what, where will it end once it is not usable anymore, for example. Uh, and this is something that is a lot to learn because it's a relatively new concept, but it's really important because uh, the municipalities uh, and the public sector has a very, very big impact on these issues. Uh, Denmark instead has focused, for example, on climate and uh, um, a good exchange of experience on uh, uh, climate change adaptation. For example, on the coastal areas and how do we protect uh, the municipalities, but at the same time do not, uh, um, do not uh, hamper the ecological status and the economic development. So how do we do that? Uh, we have tried to learn from each other and find good solutions. So that's what the Sustainable Development Expert Group does. We identify something that is important for us to work with together. And we try to either have conference or uh, good webinars, or if needed, a publication to learn from the best in our region. And we have a lot. And in all countries, each single country has a lot to tell the others, believe me. There are no best or worst. Uh, and one of the things that I thought maybe is of interest for you is that we, for example, uh, work also a lot with young people. And we have, um, in collaboration with one of our partners uh, from uh, Russia, we have developed this game of goals that you might see some uh, um, nice, uh, um, the, the logo is very similar to a famous uh, book and TV series. Uh, and the idea is to get uh, young people or the team to work together, uh, utilizing these goals to develop a national agenda. So here you have a person who is in the team responsible for, or is the minister of entrepreneurship. And then there is the prime minister, there is the minister of environment. So you, they all have kind of a, a agenda. They have something they need to protect or some direction they want to stimulate, but they have to negotiate with the other ministers that have other priorities. And they all have to take into account their own country where they are. Uh, you see in this other card, uh, it shows some uh, statistics or some parameters. For example, we are doing really bad on the environment or like we have a lot of unemployment. So for us, it's really important to stimulate employment. And this is a good way for the, the young people, but believe me, not only young people, to understand uh, the complexity of the situations and really try to identify what is ultimately the core priority for us and what should we which direction should we go to? And we have similar initiatives also in several sectors. This goal has been used also for tourism, for example. So discussing how to develop sustainable tourism in the Baltic Sea region, utilizing this uh, sustainable development goals. Um, and, or for example, on maritime special planning, how do we develop different countries uh, taking into account that uh, the, in the sea, you need to account that uh, other countries might also have a role in and an impact on your own development, both on an environmental level, but also on an economic and social level. So how do we make sure that we focus on our priorities, but are also aware and take into account the priorities of the planet and of other countries? So that's a lot of things that maybe you can uh, follow up and be engaged with in your own country or contacting us uh, if, you, if you are curious to play this. Uh, so another area we work on is climate and the climate, um, we focus a lot especially on uh, climate adaptation. Mm, in the Baltic Sea region, we have, everybody works one way or another with climate, obviously. Uh, but what we do again here is we bring experts from the national level or from the municipalities and try to understand how to make our cities more resilient and how to mitigate. So, for example, we collaborate a lot with the colleagues um, that work with policy area transport in the Baltic Sea region. 
and explore together how to shift to uh, different types of fuels or to different modes of transport. So from, from the road to the rail, how to make sure that we can utilize better public transport or cycling, for example. Um, this is an area we work on climate. We also have, for example, broken the silos and worked with our colleagues of culture. So how to get the experts in culture from the museums, the libraries, but also artists, designers to help broadcasting the message of how each individual can make an impact on the a positive impact on climate or how to reduce our climate impact in, for example, the design sector, use different materials or different ways of designing objects, etc. And another uh, thing that perhaps you heard already yesterday is that we collaborated with uh, colleagues that work with security and civil protection. Uh, and we had a very successful project where we, where we brought together fire rescue services and civil protection people with climate experts try to figure out together how do we develop a good disaster risk reduction method for Baltic Sea region countries. So our work with climate is a lot to bring the experts on climate together with experts from other sector to make sure that climate is included in the consideration of everybody. And this is in technical jar in technical terms, it's called mainstreaming climate. So make sure climate is everywhere, climate considerations. Uh, and then we, oh, sorry, I jumped too much. Um, then we work, uh, we have another expert group that is called Sustainable Maritime Economy and where our colleagues from Helcom are very, very active. Here we, we bring together experts that work in the sector to make the maritime economy greener and more sustainable. And there I have chosen just two of the goals, sustainable development goals. And please, it is not only those, but just to give you an example uh, that here we try to combine the needs of the economy and the, like the, fa the fact that we need to have like a good prosperity, good, good work but at the same time trying to balance the uh, ecosystem and make sure that we are not uh, um, destroying the environment where we live. Uh, another area that we work on, and this is really for you to know that when we talk about sustainable region, we're not talking only about the environment, we're talking about like this overall concept of social, environmental, and, and uh, economic sustainability. And we are working with uh, labor issues, which means um, we have a, a, a labor forum where we get experts together to, to learn from each other. And for example, right now we have a project that is called Sustainable Working Life, where we try to think, how do we make sure that uh, um, when we become old, uh, when we age, one says, um, we, you know, we can still be productive. When we, many, very often we retire, but we have a lot of knowledge and a lot of energy and how to ensure that that we do not lose, that we get still uh, a lot of input from, from these people, but also how do we make sure that the young people get uh, included and in a learning process where young people learn from older but also teach to be older about their own skills and how we make this as we say cross-generational um, balance much more sustainable and one of the things we have already worked a lot of course is what does it mean sustainable working life during a pandemic where some people have to stay for hours and hours in front of a computer like we're doing today with reduced movement and uh, uh, re there is no space between public uh, between professional and personal life and the problems that give this was other people can absolutely not do that they have to work physically and get out and put their own life at danger 
because they have to provide services for the society. So what does it mean, sustainable working life in a pandemic? That is, of course, a very interesting topic we are addressing. Uh, and the last part is that we, we get to work on science research innovation. So we have a network of universities that come together and discuss uh, and, they, and they create collaboration, also exchange programs. And one of the things that maybe is interesting for some of you is that we have every year the Baltic Science Award, where we give a prize to the researchers, both bachelor, master and uh, PhD, that give a concrete contribution to the Baltic re Sea Region sustainability. And that's very, very interesting because we have so many good research and it's important that we keep sharing all the scientific knowledge we have uh, and also the innovations that we have uh, because so that it is to the benefit of the whole Baltic Sea region and of humanity and not only of just one country. Um, that's very important if we want to be somehow sustainable, whether it is 2030 or even before, hopefully. Uh, that is not for me to say, but um, really research is the key and also what Dominic showed we have to preserve our environment and we need to do it faster than the nature would somehow provide by itself uh, because otherwise we really create new problems. So research and innovation are really very important to ensure that we help nature recover quicker. So these are to show that um, um, I think there was a thank you here. Yes, uh, sorry. Uh, this was to show that we don't only work on the environment or on climate, sustainability means so much more. And uh, I hope this is, at least from my side, the key learning today for you that sustainability is a, con um, a joining between the ecological, economic and societal um, aspects and safety all together. If one of these three elements miss, there is no sustainability. And this, before I forgot, I found the fifth element, the fifth P that I had missed. So people, planet, prosperity, peace, peace and partnership. And this you have in the chat. So I got back to that. So thank you very much for your patience. And I hope that it was clear enough. Dominic was, I don't know if I was, uh, but thank you. And if you have any questions, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank both of you. So just adding to that last slide, the thank you goes back to Dominic, to Olga. Really enjoyed listening to that. Um, and I'm sure there are questions. I know at least one was an answer. So um, let's delve right into the questions so that we have time to take as many as possible. Um, Christina, I see, has her hand up. Yes, hello. Thank you for the lecture. I have a question about the Climate Action Plan. How do you, or do you actually bring this plan to local governments of the countries of the Baltic region, like for example, for city governments? I guess it is for me. Yes. So um, yeah, the Baltic 2030 Action Plan, uh, we are basically it's set for everyone. So it's not only national governments or local, but every single person, because it relates to where we need our region to be. Um, we actually focus a lot on local governments because that's where action needs to take place. So we have a lot of programs of training, uh, of teaching what the sustainable development goals are and how to use them. And now, for example, we started now in September a project that is called Klimalock, that is climate, climate mainstreaming locally. So we bring together experts from the cities in the Baltic Sea region to kind of teach them how or to gather good knowledge on how to mainstream climate and to develop a handbook for the city governments to actually do that. Because it's 
not everybody knows how to do that. So we collect the information to help them learn from each other, but also kind of guidelines how to do it. So yes, local governments are very much in focus. But they need to apply for Provet to participate in this group. Um, well, oh. in the project, of course, we have the project partners, but when we have events, for example, conferences or webinars, then we disseminate, we, sp we spread the word and whoever is interested can register and, and they can, and not only governments, it can be also some NGO or some academic who, who needs, who is interested in the knowledge. So um, depending of course, on the type of event, we generally um, open up to registration and generally we try to do it live <laughs> outside the pandemic. So it's also very good because they, the important thing is that they know each other and they get inspired and then they ask each other for help. So we are kind of a spider in the web to connect people, get the good knowledge, but help them to learn from each other. Great. Thank you, Christina. Did you get an answer to your question? I think so. Also, Dominic uh, added to the chat where you can find uh, uh, Convoltic Sea Climate Change fact sheet. That's great. Yeah, if I just may add to that, we've, this has been recently published. So it's, um, it's been published in September. So it's really you know, the, the latest available knowledge that we have on climate change in the in the baltic sea and it's it's peer-reviewed science so these are really you know these are the facts about what we know what is already happening and what you know the possible scenarios uh, what may happen in, uh, in in the near future so and it's it's been written in a fairly you know simple simple way for um you know geared towards policymakers and and, and also the general public so it should be fairly easy to digest. Then maybe uh, Carolina, you had already said in the chat that you have a question. Yes, uh, thank you very much for a very interesting lectures. I have a question to Dominique. So I'm, um, I really want to know what we young people can do to improve the state of waters at the Baltic Sea? What can we do? What actions can we take? Yeah, thanks. This is a very good question. And as I said earlier, you are the future leaders. <laughs> you are the future, or hopefully, or some of you are you know, future policy makers. And what's really important is that you know, we get you know, ocean science into all the other silos. This is really crucial because you know the more we know about how you know the marine ecosystems work, um, the you know the more informed decisions and actions we can then take. And this is what's currently lacking. Um, you know, and also you know Olga also mentioned it, and not just on on you know on marine matters, but generally that we, we have a tendency to function in our in our silos, develop policies in our silos. So this is you know one thing is that you know, really key is like, you know, ocean literacy, you know, promote ocean science, uh, promote our understanding about the oceans. And then there are, of course, you know, individual actions that, you know, each of us can take. And again, you know, whatever you do, like in your personal, personal life is like, you know, in your day-to-day -day life, it's, you know, think, you know, whatever, you know, think about your actions, what implications uh, they may have. And that starts already when you wash your clothes, for instance, you know, your clothes are, most of our clothes are made of, you know, synthetic fibers that, you know, end up, you know, that release microplastics every time we wash them. So try to avoid, you know, this, you know, plastic synthetic fibers. Um, you know, same goes for, for um, you know, for eutrophication. Try to look for products that are, you know, that are farmed in, a, you know, sustainable, usually says, even if it's expensive, but, you know, wherever you can, you know, try to live, in, you know, the, the most, you know, marine friendly you know friendly friendly manner yeah so but these are the things you know these are the two you know there's at, at your personal you know, at your personal level you know change you know change your behavior um but that also means you need to understand so you know learn try to learn more about how you know this these, these processes work what are the land sea interactions 
and then in your professional career take all of this you know take all this knowledge into you know wherever you will be working and especially if it's at the policy level thank you thank you both of you um, next up then i think simona Thank you. Uh, thank you for very interesting presentations. Um, I'm bubbling with questions, actually, but I'll try to restrain myself. Um, I don't know for who it is, whoever feels uh, that we can answer. Uh, SDGs in general have been, um, have had the concern of being too idealistic to be able to actually reach, especially until 2030. Uh, do you believe that these action plans in, that we have in the Baltic Sea region could have the same um, factor or do you think they are actually achievable until that deadline or do you believe that after the deadline we will be just uh, changing it but still keeping the same goals? And the other one, uh, quick question. Are there any projects uh, uniting different regions? Because climate change is, will never be one region's or one state's goal. So are there any initiatives uh, with collaboration of other regions? Dominique, you can start. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, we need, we need ambitious goals. There is, you know, there's no way around it, you know, the, and, and the more ambitious, the better. And even if we do not reach them, you know, then we adjust. And this is, for instance, what happened to, uh, to the Baltic Sea Action Plan that was, um, you know, it, the initial plan was adopted in 2007. And in 2007, um, the, you know, it stated the plan already, the plan stated that, you know, good environmental status or a sea in a healthy state should be achieved by 2021. <laughs> But it was already clear in, in 2018 that that you know, we would never attain this this objective because you know it was far too ambitious. But nevertheless, um, you know the, the Helcom ministers, which are the ministers of uh, mainly of you know of the environment of the Baltic Sea countries, they still decided to update the plan, and we now have um, an implementation date of uh, 2030. Yeah, but without the high level of ambition, we would never be where we are right now. So it's better to, you know, to be over ambitious and then to adapt and not achieving these goals. Um, it's not necessarily a failure. And we see that, you know, there are some clear benefits from, you know, having this, these ambitious goals because, you know, they also lead you know, to all sorts of actions and measures that are then put into place to achieving them and which would not be put into place if it weren't for, you know, the level of ambition of, of these goals. And it's just, you know, our systems are like, at least for the Baltic Sea, it's, it's so complex that, you know, the ecosystem, there's a lag in the ecosystem to respond to, to actions. So, you know, we cannot always foresee how, you know, how a specific measure will, will work. It could be that, you know, whatever measures we have put into place in 2007 will only yield results in 2030, right? So does it mean, you know, is it, has it failed? Uh, no, it just, it just, took the ecosystem more time to respond. And especially when you have you know, dynamic and very fluid ecosystem like marine ones where you know, water has no boundaries, you know, things are fluid, things are constantly moving. Um, sometimes like for instance, the Baltic Sea, you have you know, concentration of nutrients that are depending on the wind and the currents and you know, things move and, and, and things need time. You know, ecosystems are slow you know, to, to respond to, to our measures. It's a bit like you know, like like a big ship, you know, like like the Titanic. You know, it you know you can steer it around, but it takes forever for the boat to actually you know change course. Yeah, thank you. Over to you, Olga. Yeah, I, I fully agree with uh, with the Dominic. And to be honest, um, it's really important to to set yourself some. You know, the the vision is a dream, right? We have a dream, and it's the dream that helps you to kind of actually try to do something. If, you, if your dream is low, where you're gonna strive less. So the ambition of having really tough uh, visions is that you will try harder and will maybe even if you don't achieve it, you will arrive 
higher, closer to the goal. So um, it is really not up to me to say whether we're going to achieve these visions, but I think that doesn't matter. I agree with Dominic, you need to have something ambitious to try and go um, further. Uh, and this, uh, sorry, the second question I think I could answer, but can you just quickly remind me? I was just wondering about collaborations with different yes. regions. Uh, we collaborate a lot. Um, in the, I will just make a very concrete example. Uh, in this region, there is a, what is called the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region, which is a collaboration between the EU countries on the Baltic Sea. Of course, it's not all, but some. Uh, and there are other similar um, strategies around Europe. There is the Danube region, there is the Adriatic in Ionian, there is the Alpine. And we have a, actually um, constant uh, coordination and uh, collaboration meetings. Uh, for example, on climate, it happens regularly, I think yearly or every second year, that the people that work with that topic from those regions come together and kind of learn. And uh, we have cooperation with other, uh, I mean, of, of course, especially in Europe, uh, but we are also present in other arenas. So um, you are totally right. Uh, we need to exchange, but it's also really important to keep in mind that, that we also need to be able to manage um, our actions. So it's, it's always also good to have a little smaller scale so that we, it, it becomes manageable. Um, so it's important that we have UN, we have the cities, but we also have the midway to kind of make sure that we don't work on our little bubble, but not in an unmanageable world. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, I've seen in the chat, there is a question on tourism. So I will quickly take that up too. Um, of course, tourism is a big challenge. And again, this is where the messages are important because on one hand, you want like um, economic uh, yeah, um, prosperity and uh, support to the local communities, but on the other, you don't want to uh, impair the sea. So um, we are working on sustainable tourism in our sustainable and prosperous region. And uh, if you saw in this uh, Baltic leadership program, culture and tourism is one of the areas. And actually it's about sustainable tourism. So there is a lot of uh, um, work on how, what it means and how we promote sustainable tourism, how to ensure that the support goes to local economies. But of course, again, we are in a globalized world. So there is as much we can do also in the Council of the Baltic Sea States in Helcom to control, you know, the overall dynamic that goes in the Baltic Sea region. So not always are we able to steer the big cruise companies, but we can have them into dialogue and get them to um, act towards a goal that we define together. So that would be in short my my answer, like well, the CBSS, of course, doesn't have the superpower to fix the world, but we try to do whatever we can to get people to talk and to be, to make a better world. If, if I may just add add to that, um, the Baltic Sea is it's a bit of a front runner when it comes to to rules and regulations, and especially when it comes to shipping. So the Baltic is already is what we call you know special uh, special control areas on on both nitrogen and, and sulfur emissions from from ships, and you know all big ships need to you know comply to certain standards when it comes to to emissions, and the same will also apply to um, at some stage to emissions of wastewater, for instance, so wastewater and grey water from uh, from from ships, so that you know this. Like especially the cruises um, that they are, you know, not that the impact or the you know ecological footprint is is actually um, you know as low as possible. And we are also developing you know action plans on uh, on underwater noise um, just to make sure that you know the you know biodiversity is not um, hit too hard by you know this the sea based activities and that includes includes the cruises. And we also have measures in place at port, um, you know, how to deal, especially with you know wastewater. I mean, when you have you know several thousand people on a cruise boat, they do generate a lot of mess, 
and all of that we just need to make sure that it doesn't enter enter the sea and but the baltic is you know it's a global front runner when it in, in that regard and you know the port reception facilities are actually uh, quite good especially in like in finland for instance we have very good you know port port reception facilities to to get all this wastewater into you know into the municipal um, municipal system so that they are they are treated and not you know discharged at sea, and we also monitor. We have some very good monitoring um, of these shipping activities just to make sure that there are no illegal discharges uh, in in the Baltic. Thank you. Great, thank you again for all those questions. It's really nice to see you being engaged and asking all that uh, also the, to the question in the chat and so keep them coming i will ask lily there next do you have a question hello um i wanted to say sorry sorry you can't see me my camera's broken um, <laughs> yeah i have a question is kind of to do with what dominic was saying towards someone else's question before of have there been any attempts at any kind of legal frameworks or initiatives to make things like sustainable development goals binding or to, for example, um, limit, limit eutrophication in certain areas or give um, species or, for example, even bodies of water kind of legal rights or anything like that? Yeah. This is this is a very good question because at, at Helcom we you know we we are an instrument of you know of uh, international law. I mean we have this uh, the Helsinki Convention, and it is legally binding. But all you know the stuff that we produce um, it's it's mainly recommendations, um, so it's not legally binding. So we rely a little bit on the goodwill of our contracting parties uh, of the countries to implement. Uh, what they have actually decided on, but the good thing that you know that's and that's uh, I think you know, Olga will um, yeah would agree to that as well is that in the Baltic we have this you know very good culture of actually following up <laughs> on on our word and you know to implement what we've said and at Helcom for instance you know all these recommendations are based on um, you know our process are you know bottom up you know science based and it starts. Whenever we start, for instance, on a recommendation, um, or when we fix, you know, threshold values for, you know, the input of you know, maximum input of nutrients, for instance, it all starts at an expert level, and the experts, the expert level is constituted, you know, these are experts from, you know, from the agencies, from from the Baltic Sea countries that deal with these matters, and then it it escalates higher up into into the ministries. So when these recommendations or or measures, when once they are adopted. You know, there's already you know there's a massive consensus behind them so not just at the regional level but also you know within the ministries within the the agencies that these are things that need to be implemented and then you know some countries uh, do actually you know when it comes to the helicom recommendations uh, some of the countries then you know devise some laws around them you know, for instance this is the case uh, estonia is is really you know they are really trying to transform our recommendations into into their national law and then we of course also you know work quite closely with the european union and, and there you know there is of course the eu has um, at least for those countries of helcom that are members of the eu as well so helcom has you know eight eight contracting parties that are eu members and then there is russia which isn't but we still you know work quite closely together with the eu and and the EU then has, you know, a bit more legally binding uh, directives that, that they need to be implemented. And there is an input, you know, from Helcom, or you know, a dialogue takes place in Helcom that then also benefits uh, because you know the members are the same. But then that also, you know, benefits, uh, you know, crafting laws or the process of crafting laws at the, at the EU level, which is then binding. Thank you. Great, nice. So um, I don't know if you want to consider if there's one last question or so before we close for the evening. I thought it was so interesting also if you think about yesterday that there are many 
aspects, key points coming up again and again. Also, like while there is much to do, which was mentioned by Stephanie and Adrian yesterday, that the Baltic Sea region is kind of a front runner and uh, doing well in some parts as well, also in comparison to other regions, maybe. Also collaboration coming up again and again and youth. So we really appreciate that you are here taking your time. You're really important to all the areas. So it's that's really appreciated and we hope you yeah, enjoy listening have more questions um also tomorrow of course don't know if there's any last thought or question for today otherwise i would say our speakers definitely deserve a huge round of, of applause thank you for being here and back on a friday evening thank you very much I'd like to thank you, Francisca and, and Olga, and of course, you know, all, all the other participants. And this is exactly the kind of um, kind of event that we need. Um, this is, you know, in response to the question that was asked um, on what can we do? Well, this is it. Yeah, this is one of the things that, that we should do more frequently uh, if you want to address the issues and, you know, keep on talking about them and, you know, just inform, get, you know, get informed and then act you know based on you know take informed informed decisions then so thank you very much and thank you for inviting helcom <laughs> to this to this event yeah thank, thank you and great from questions too exactly i wanted to say thank you for well being patient on a friday evening but also for really interesting and somehow challenging questions that what we need and that's what we want young people engage because you are the ones who are able to kind of shake out our uh, our minds and get us to reflect okay but this we need to consider as well and we hope at least that's my hope that you become really really kind of good you know uh silos breaker thinkers uh, and that uh, as i told francisca i say it in a very very selfish way because when I will be old, you will be the leaders of the world, and I need to be sure that it is in good hands. So please uh, learn as much as you can and take right choices for today, but also for tomorrow. Thank you. Those were good words, both from Dominic and Olga. So thank you again. Thank you all. Please uh, remember, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. I know it's been a lot then, but I'm very much looking forward to meeting you again. Uh, also a bit more closely then for our group sessions and getting together and getting to work. <laughs> so um, remember 9.30 Central European time. Um, if there are any other questions, both topic or organization wise, let me know. Otherwise, uh, excited for tomorrow. <laughs> Have a nice evening. Thank you for joining. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.